All right. Book of uh, Proverbs today. This is going to be one of those messages where I'm just going to basically let uh, let God do most of the talking. I don't mean through my voice as such, but I came to a conclusion a long time ago that I could have an approach that would go either, either one way or another here. I could give a verse and speak, you know, 40 minutes on that verse. And a lot of guys do. And it, it's, they're very, very good messages that come out. I never found myself that good that I could pull it off. And so I guess I resorted to plan B. And that was that I'll throw a whole lot of verses in there and talk a little teeny bit about e each one. That way God gets more coverage than I get, basically. And that's the approach that we're going to do today. I want to look at some just common sense stuff out of the book of Proverbs. And these are life-enhancing, life-warning, life-enriching, whatever, just little dinky verses that say a tremendous amount about human nature and about life itself. We know that Solomon, as declared by the Bible, was the wisest man that ever lived, and he was the richest man that ever lived. And we can kind of put that in perspective because we know who the richest guy today is, and that's Bill Gates, but he doesn't really make a big <clears throat> deal about his riches. He kind of you know, flies under the radar, and so we don't really hear that much about him or his lifestyle or, you know, what he does with his billions. But Solomon was the richest man that ever lived on the face of the earth. And it's interesting how he got that. There was a time when David was still king, that David was Solomon's dad, and they were having a discussion one day, and David knew that Solomon would inherit from him, and he would be the next king of Israel after, after himself. He knew that. And he took his boy aside one day, and he said, Look, God will come to you someday, and he will ask you what, you would, what he would like to you know, do for you, or what you would like him to do for you. He said, when that day comes, if you've got any brains at all in your head, you will tell God that you want wisdom so that you can govern the people. Well, time goes on. Now, most of us, if we had that unbelievable opportunity where someone says, you know, God will literally, physically, audibly come into your presence and ask you, what he can do for you. What would most of us say? Well, I don't know. Health? But that's an age thing. You know, the young people, the, you know, the teenagers, the first thing on the top of their list is not a health thing. I mean, they, they have no concept of what's coming down the line. They are literally, in their minds, bulletproof. They're eternal. That's the way it should be, you know, mentally and emotionally. Little kids shouldn't have to worry about diabetes and arthritis and heart attacks and all this kind of stuff. So, what does a person ask for? Riches? No, that, that might not be a bad one. But David knew. He said, if you ever, or when the chance comes, when the opportunity gets there, and God asks you what he can do for you. You say you want wisdom. And so the day came of which God came to Solomon. Turn over to, uh, I have not had you turn to uh, Proverbs first, but uh, look back into Second Chronicles for a second. Second Chronicles.
chapter 1. 2 Chronicles chapter 1, beginning at verse 7. In that night did God appear unto Solomon and said unto him, Ask what I shall give thee. What a deal. Verse 8. And Solomon said unto God, Thou hast showed great mercy unto David my father, and hast made me to reign in his stead. Now, O Lord God, let thy promise unto David my father be established, for thou hast made me king over a people like the dust of the earth in multitude. Verse 10. Give me now wisdom and knowledge that I may go out and come in before this people. For who can judge this thy people that is so great? So as David predicted, God came to Solomon, God asked Solomon, and Solomon said, give me wisdom and understanding. Now since God knows human nature, he knew that 99 people out of 100 all other things being equal, that you know, you're not on the verge of death or, or some catastrophe like that, but all things being equal, most people would ask for riches. Solomon didn't. And I think that at some level that impressed God to the point that he, say, and he says it you know, later on in here. He says, since you did not ask for riches, but asked instead for wisdom, I'm going to make you the wisest person that ever lived. And to boot, I'm going to make you the richest person who ever lived. So it was a, a done deal for Solomon. But Solomon had a strange life in that when he started out, young guy and God had given him all this wisdom and knowledge and understanding everything was okay but as time changed Solomon began to change he never lost the wisdom that did not deteriorate until the day he died he was the wisest and the uh, the term smartest might not be the right term. I don't, wisdom has nothing to do with IQ. But he was the wisest man in all the earth up until the day he died. But he let sin creep into his life in such a point that it basically deteriorated his relationship with God. And this was due to the fact that he had all these wives and they just nickled and dimed him to death. Oh, honey, do you think on this holiday that we've got coming up in my homeland that I was brought up in and raised in, and we used to bring little flowers uh, to pay homage to the, the, the god of fertility so that we would have a good crop. Do you think I just might have a little bouquet of flowers that I can put over here in a little niche out of the way and do my little thing on a Sunday morning and not get in anybody's way? Eh, go ahead. Don't bug me about it. Well, he had 300 wives and 700 concubines. He had virtually a thousand women in his life. Every one of them. Give me this. Give me that. Can I do this? And can I do that? And before you know it, he was up to his eyeballs in idolatry. He had just given in. He acquiesced. Whatever they wanted, they could have. So the groves were built. The idols were built. The altars were built. And dur <clears throat> during his reign, Israel virtually collapsed as a moral nation. And after the book, I 
on Proverbs. You get Lamentations in there, Ecclesiastes and so forth. And in Ecclesiastes, he is basically bearing his heart as how he knew he screwed up, how he knew he had the, the wheels had fallen off, <clears throat> and he did things or he allowed things that should not have happened. But in all this, it still remained that until the day he died, he was the wisest man. He just he knew the difference. When Eve blew it in the garden and Adam blew it in the garden there was a monster monster distinction between the two the end result was the same they both sinned they both disobeyed God but the means by which they sinned was entirely different Eve was faked out she was beguiled she was seduced And she took the fruit. Adam went in with his eyes wide open. His was his open rebellion. He wasn't faked out. The tree being good for food and, you know, good, pleasant to the eyes and a tree to be desired to make one wise. No, he knew he shouldn't partake of it and he just did it anyway. Because he wanted to stay with Eve. He took one look at her. He knew she was fallen. He knew that that Shekinah glory, that light that encompassed her, he came around that corner or under the tree or whatever it happened to be, and he took one look at her, and he knew instantaneously she was toast. So he wasn't beguiled. He wasn't tricked by the devil. Eve was. Adam went in with his eyes wide open. Open rebellion, open defiance. The interesting thing about that whole scenario is that when we get to the book of Timothy in the New Testament, Paul directly says that between the two of them, between Adam and between Eve, between what they did, Eve has the primary fault. She gets the onus and the burden of the blame. It was Eve. <clears throat> now, get into the heart and the mind of God to figure out how this distinction comes about. One is beguiled and tricked into sin. One goes into sin with his eyes wide open. And God says, I blame Eve more than I blame Adam. All right, back to Proverbs. Chapter 1. What's the moral of this story, guys? <laughs> Proverbs is an incredible book. It is one of these books that you, sh you should read just continually, all the time. You know, do, do your other Bible reading, do your other study and so forth, but just it, one little part of you, just gravitate to the book of Proverbs. And just read it. When you get done, read it again. When you get done, read it again. It is incredible. The, the wealth of knowledge and wisdom and stuff that is in here for us. Chapter 1. And then we're just going to hit a few of these as time goes on here. Verse 7. First thing I want us to see today. Proverbs 1, 7. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. But fools despise wisdom and instruction. So if you want to get smart, or if you think you're smart, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. So if someone doesn't fear God, I don't care what the IQ is. I don't, want the, I don't care what the educational accomplishments are. If you don't fear God, you're an idiot. Verse 24. Because I have called, and ye refused. This is God speaking now. Because I have, and this is a tough passage. 
I'll tell you right now, if the average do-gooder, coping, caring, loving, sharing Christian gets a hold of this verse, they don't know what to do with it. These, these passages in here. Beginning in verse 24. Because I have called, and ye refused. You know, come unto me, all ye the labor and heavy laden. I'll give you rest. Nah, I'll do it myself. Ye must be born again. Eh, pfft, later. Nah, because I have called, and ye refused. I have stretched out my hand, and no man regarded. But ye have set at naught. That means nothing. All my counsel and would none of my reproof. Verse 26. I also will laugh at your calamity. I will mock when your fear cometh. Boy, how does that one line up with John 3, 16? I mean, that's about the only verse that 90% of, you know, this world knows or understands. <clears throat> this is not a John 3, 16 verse, I'll tell you. I will imagine this. This is God, the creator of the universe, the guy who just sat there and spoke and universes came into being. I will laugh at your calamity. Oh, God would never send anybody to hell. God's a loving God. He'll give everybody chance after chance after chance. Are you sure about that? Or is that your wishful thinking? Or is that your preconceived ideas based on what you learn in your house? I, I, this is the type of verse that just I can hardly get my head around. God saying this, I'm going to laugh at your calamity. I will mock when your fear cometh. When your fear cometh as desolation and your destruction cometh as a whirlwind, when distress and anguish cometh upon you, then shall they call upon me. Whew. Thank goodness. Not quite. Then shall they call upon me, but I will not answer. They shall seek me early, but they shall not find me. So you can kiss purgatory goodbye. You can kiss limbo goodbye. You can kiss second chances goodbye. You can throw away the concept that a loving God would never send anybody to an eternal hell. That is pure wishful thinking. Chapter 2, verse 6. For the Lord giveth wisdom. Out of his mouth cometh knowledge and understanding. Okay, if that be true, how do we communicate with God today? Well, we can communicate, we communicate with God in prayer. We bow our head or close our eyes or we drive down the road or we just sit there with a blank stare on our face, whatever. But we pray to God. That, that's communication on our part. How does God generally commune back with us? I've never heard an audible word from God before. I don't know what his voice sounds like. I can read what the descriptions of what a voice sounds like if I go to Revelation and Ezekiel and places like that. But I've never heard the audible voice of God before. So how does God communicate with me? Well, he can communicate with me through my spirit, let's say. The Holy Spirit of God can speak to my spirit, but that leaves a lot of leeway, especially on my part. How do I recognize it's the Spirit of God? Maybe it's fear within me. Maybe it's wishful thinking within me. Maybe I have a preconceived agenda and I'm looking for validation on this stuff. Maybe I'm up one day and down the next day. So how do I interpret these emotions and feelings that are so on squiggly ground here? Well, there's one way God can communicate with us. 
that is not bound by emotion or circumstance or wishful thinking or preconceived ideas, and that is the Word of God. We communicate with Him through prayer. He communicates back to us through the Word of God. If you don't read the Word of God, if you don't study the Word of God, if you don't keep your nose in it all the time, God's not communicating with you. Your feelings, your emotions, who you ascribe from God, are not necessarily that at all. The Lord giveth wisdom. Out of his mouth. Remember, Peter tells us that holy, as far as his Bible is concerned, holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. Chapter 3, Proverbs. And this is one that we've looked at a whole bunch of times before, but it is so true. It is so common sense. It is so relevant. Chapter 3, verse 5. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart. Lean not into thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy path. We spend so much of our time trying to determine God's will based on our feelings, circumstance, conditions that, you know, may prevail in our lives. That when you get right down to it, this seems pretty easy, but in reality, we it's hard for us. Trust in the Lord. With all thine heart? <clears throat> Lean not into thine own understanding? We see circumstance around. That's our, real that's our reality. That's our understanding. If some big bully is walking down the sidewalk after you and he's got a baseball bat in his hand and he's looking at you and pointing and calling out your name, well, there, the circumstances and the understanding is... I'm in deep doo-doo here. And that's the mud hole that we find ourselves in all the time. We can't seem to get out of that mode of letting reality or you know circumstance and what we perceive as reality dictate how things are. God says, no, there's another reality here, and that's me. My ways are not your ways. My thoughts are not your thoughts. You trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not unto your own understanding. The problem comes our way. Well, we've got books. We've got advice. We've got mentors. We know how we should approach the problem. We know how we would like to get out of the problem. And so we begin to work the problem. We work the plan. God says, that's your understanding. I've got a whole different level here. Don't lean on you. Lean on me. And he's given us hundreds and hundreds of examples through the Bible. It's like the disciples when they were in the ship crossing the Sea of Galilee and the storm comes up. And the boat is getting, you know, awash. With the, the waves are coming in to the boat. And these are professional fishermen. I mean, they make their living. They've spent their lives out on this thing. They know what it's like. But at this point, because of this particular storm, these guys are scared spitless. They are fearing for their lives. What's Jesus doing? He's taking a nap in the back of the boat. He's sound asleep. And they're yelling and screaming, Master, carest thou not that we perish? He wakes up, looks around, tells the waves to stop, tells the wind to stop, and he looks at him and he says, What is your problem? You could have done this. 
You wake me up out of a nap, out of a sleep, just to do this? They were leaning on their understanding. And God has a whole different level up here of which we can't see, feel, experience because we're so consumed with our little understanding here. So when he says, trust in the Lord and lean not unto thine own understanding, that's hard for us to do. It's like a little kid learning how to ride a bike for the first time. And you as the, the, the mom or the dad, you, you're, you're standing beside the kid, they're on the bike, the training wheels are off, and you got your hand right there in the back of that seat, right where their butt hits that chair, and you begin to push them, and they're pedaling, and they're all scared, and they're wobbling. Don't let me go, don't let me go, don't let me go. And unbeknownst to them, you let them go five minutes ago. They didn't know that you weren't there. They're so wrapped up in the thing, they didn't see it. But their understanding was altogether different. God says, look, I'll take care of you. But you've got to trust me to do it. You've got to get your eyes off the circumstances and get them on me. And that is, that's the key. That is so easier said than done. And that, that's what distinguishes these guys that made it into the pages of this book. They could do it. Sometimes we can't. If any man lack wisdom, let him ask of God. It's the only way we're going to get it. All right, we'll, we'll dip into this uh, from time to time as we go on here. But a uh, little bit of wisdom from a guy who had a thousand women in his life. Heavenly Father, I thank you that you saw fit to take the time to put into book form, page form, instructions for us that we can read, that we can learn, that we can memorize, and hopefully one day that we can actually take it into our hearts. There's lots of verses in here that I can memorize, Lord. There's lots of verses that I can kind of get, but there is a lot of verses that I just don't really at the end of the day be able to appropriate unto myself the way that you meant that it should be I'm still in that category leaning unto my own understanding being fearful of the things around me that I can't control being fearful of the things that may happen in life that haven't happened yet but we we fear them Lord, help each and every one of us to get to a point in our lives that when it says trust in the Lord, that we really trust in the Lord, regardless of circumstance, regardless of outward appearance, regardless of how we see things, that we can get to a point just like Paul. Well, I've learned how to have a lot of things. I've learned how to have nothing doesn't make any difference to me because at the end of the day it's all God Lord bless your people watch over them lead them guide them encourage them enlighten them help them in Jesus name
Thank you.